Dominique Puzio. Um, and Dominic wanted me to tell you that he is currently the happy father of two plants and wants uh, someday maybe to move up to mammals, but we'll see. Uh, they're both from the Center of Machine Learning from Capital One and here to, to tell us how we can make our machine learning programs work in real time. Thank you. Please welcome the speakers. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here in the room and to all those watching the live stream as they nurse their hangovers uh, in their hotel rooms. Thanks for being here as well. Uh, I'm Dominic Puzio. I'm Kate Heinem. And today we want to talk to you about a solution that we built to detect malware uh, in our real-time network logs. So disclaimer, uh, this is our first Schmoocon talk. We're really excited. I was brought here a couple years ago. Thank you. Brought here a couple years ago, I was sharing a badge with like 18 other people and I like tagged in for a couple hours, saw a couple cool talks, uh, so it's really cool to be on the stage with you all today. We work at Capital One, but we're not here to endorse any particular product. That's what Samuel Jackson is for. We're just here to talk tech with you. So the problem, malware happens everywhere, even at large financial institutions. The malware lifecycle looks kind of like this. Malware gets downloaded onto someone's machine, and this step is rather hard to detect and, and rather hard to stop. Maybe they download an attachment from an email or go to a URL that they shouldn't be going to. The next step is that malware is going to reach out to the command and control hub. This is where it gets some instructions. Maybe it downloads second stage malware now that it knows about your processor and the OS that you're running. Uh, this is where it's going to send any sensitive information that it wants to exfiltrate. So this middle step is really key and allows it to then go and do some really bad things on your network. So this is where we focused our attention on this command and control communication and could we detect that uh, in our network logs. So in the olden days, this wasn't too difficult. The nice thing was is that malware would hard code this location, a domain or an IP address, and it would always be reaching out to that same spot. This is pretty easy for us to detect in our logs. If we all of a sudden see a big spike to a particular IP address, that looks a little bit weird to us. And if we can reverse engineer this malware, then we can isolate that particular domain or IP, and we can blacklist it. From there, the malware is relatively inert. Even though it could be all over our network, it couldn't do much because it can't get out to the command and control. The issue is that malware got smarter and started building this domain generation algorithm into this command and control communication process. So instead of reaching out to one single static domain or IP, it has an algorithm that's calling out to 10, 100, 1,000 domains each and every day. And those domains are being randomly generated, maybe putting together random characters or random words to generate uh, these different domains and in doing so, blend into regular traffic. Uh, it looks a lot more natural. So DGAs are trying to avoid detection by generating all of these different domains on the fly. And it makes it a lot harder to blacklist. Even if you know Dominic's machine is infected with malware, called out to these 10 domains today, by tomorrow those domains are gonna be completely different. It's gonna be using a random seed that's based on the day or the time, something like that. So blacklisting becomes much less effective uh, when DGAs are present. You need something with a little bit more intelligence behind it. So how do we combat DGAs? And the first is, is this blacklisting idea that can be very tedious if you're generating you know, 10 or maybe 100 domains, but becomes impossible pretty quickly uh, once you get into these big numbers. We can try to reverse engineer a DGA to figure out which domains it's going to generate. So if I know the algorithm it's going to use, I can say, well, what domains are you gonna generate for me tomorrow? And then I can blacklist those ahead of time. The issue is that this, uh, this depends on us being able to first isolate that malware and then reverse engineer it. And generally by the time that's happened, the malware's been present in our network for weeks or for months. Some really interesting research that we leaned on for this is using DNS traffic and looking for these non-existent domain responses from particular machines. So you can imagine that if you're calling out to these 100 or 1,000 domains that the DGA uh, is, is giving to the malware, the attacker on the other end is going to know those domains for that particular day and selectively register only a few of them. 
So maybe only two or three of those are going to actually resolve and be tied back to the command and control network. So this is domain fluxing, where the IP infrastructure stays the same, but the domain names are being rotated in and out on a daily basis. So you know, maybe I fat finger a domain once or twice a day and I get a non-existent domain response. But for the most part, it looks really weird if there's a bunch of these NXD responses, if there's a lot of non-existent domain calls from a particular machine. And that's a pretty good giveaway of malware activity. However, it's historical. It's backwards looking. It doesn't help us to do this in any sort of real-time way. We can only look back after we have days or weeks of logs. And at a large enterprise, it can be really hard to get your hands on these logs, and it can be very, very large volume. So again, it's really hard to do this in a timely fashion. So we decided to build a machine learning solution, something that could learn from existing DGA families that we know are out there, and then make decisions based purely on the domain name that the computer is querying. So not looking back in time, just making a real-time decision based on what's happening now on that machine. The reason why we thought machine learning would be a good solution for this is that this algorithmically generated text looks different from normal text. You can see it's, it's pretty easy for us to identify these in, in just a glance. And a human crafted domain is going to have some features that make it stand out. It's going to be phonetically plausible. You can pronounce it out loud and tell people, oh, hey, go check out my site uh, on Reddit or check out my blog. Uh, you can recognize words in these domains. You know, even though occasionally these ones on the left have a word in them, it's kind of buried in there. Uh, and sometimes uh, DGAs will combine random words instead of random characters. And so we want to ask, do these words make sense together? New York Times. So we started to look at how we could detect these uh, DGA domains and realize that there was a divide. There are two different uh, subgroups within DGAs, some that combine random characters and some that combine random words. These random character ones are fairly easy to spot, but the random words one take maybe a half second longer for you. Just You have to read them and think, board laptop attorneys, which is a real uh, domain that uh, DJ Mauer has used, board laptop attorneys doesn't make sense as a domain. Cakes lower garage, what could that domain possibly be tied to? So. We set out to detect this subcategory of DGAs, what we call dictionary DGAs, where they're taking domains from a, uh, a pile of words from a dictionary, randomly smashing them together to create these domains. So that's our project. Could we build a model that could detect dictionary DGA activity? And could we build one that operated in real time, that could take this and put it in live traffic and generate alerts for analysts to dive into? So with that, I'll turn it over to Kate. So our project we called Alphabet Soup. We're trying to identify the impastas. <laughs> so we had two approaches. I'm glad you guys are all awake. Um, <laughs> sorry, you want me to go back to that slide? <laughs> um, so we had two approaches. One was looking at the. <laughs> fair, fair. Fair. <laughs> I was expecting that. Um, <laughs> We had two approaches. One was the content of the domain, right? So trying to see, do these words make sense? Um, and we used a natural language approach using a biogram co-location model, which I'll go through in a sec. And then we also wanted to look through the structure. Is there a difference in the way a uh, random word domain is being structured versus a human-made domain? Um, and for that, we used deep learning. And we came up with an ensemble model that uses a long short-term memory network and a convolutional neural net, which we'll go through in just a second if you're not familiar with them. So the first one is the natural language approach, the bigram co-location. We take two words, bigrams, and we try and see what's the likelihood of these words being put together, the co-location of them. Uh, if it has a non-zero score, the model will say, um, hey, I've seen these words together before. I make sense. But if it's a zero, then we know they don't go together. So if you give it salad and listings, it would give us something really small or zero because it's never seen salad and listings together. But chicken salad, it's probably seen that in an article. Property chicken, again, doesn't quite make sense. But property listings, that's probably seen before. So it'll give us a non-zero score. So with this model, um, we were saying, uh, 
if we can pick out all the different words, then we should be good for trying to analyze the content of the domain. So to train it, we always need lots of data. So we did four years of New York Times articles, and we had to go through and find all of the bigrams. So if you find something like law school or world war, right, we should get a non-zero score. It's seen these words together. Um, but if you see something like law war, it's seen them in the same article, but it should be a very small score um, in the domain. Now, we, were, we had very high expectations, right? All of the ones we've seen before seem to be uh, not words that you would normally put together. However, this is not exactly the case. You might have heard of YouTube or MailChimp. When would you ever put those words together in an article, right? So our model didn't do too well. Now, we could have pursued this a little bit further, tried different things for natural language, but we had such success with deep learning that we just pursued that instead. And we kind of concluded that our natural language approach might not be the best, and we needed to kind of analyze what is natural language when you're coming up with a domain name versus putting words in a sentence, right? There's probably some difference in the way you would structure your pairing of words, and that might influence um, our results with this natural language approach. So deep learning has several benefits. Uh, one of them is that it's highly flexible. Uh, it's proven to work very well for complex language problems. You also don't need handcrafted features. For a lot of uh, statistical approaches, you need to uh, say, look for the number of consonants or check out the distribution of characters. Um, deep learning figures that out for you. You just give it a whole training set, and then it tries to learn and tweak itself to figure out what features it deems are appropriate. So we don't have to go through that. And then because it's doing its self-tweaking, it also works kind of like a black box. So it makes it a lot harder to try to figure out how it's working and reverse engineer it um, for someone to bypass our deep learning network. Now deep learning, like most machine learning models, or all machine learning models, requires a large amount of data. So what data did we use? We had a set for legitimate and a set for malicious. Um, we use the Alexa top 1 million domains, which are the most popular sites that people go to. So you have things like Twitter and Pinterest and Microsoft, PayPal, right? Seems like two words put together, but they make sense. And then we needed a corpus of malicious domains. Now this, we would have had to struggle to try and find this data, but luckily uh, there's a whole database full of reverse engineered DGA families. And the DGA family is um, several DGAs that have been grouped either by purpose or by the method of their generation. And we empirically chose a bunch of them that seem to be using random words. So if you see things like pie living bites, hmm, that doesn't look right, but you know, we have our malicious training set. And as the deep learning model is going through them, it can say, oh, okay, I'm gonna, you give me Microsoft. Um, I think this is malicious. And then you say, no, it's not malicious. And it goes back and it tries to figure out what it did wrong and tweak itself. So our final model looks something like this. Now it looks kind of like a lot, so we're gonna go through it step by step. But the goal is to give it a domain and then have it output a probability of it being a dictionary DGA. Make sense? So the input. If you're not familiar with deep learning or machine learning models, uh, it's a lot of linear algebra. So as it's going through, you need the input to be translated into a matrix, and it needs to be a set size. So if you hand me any size string, the max characters are actually 63, in case you're wondering, um, then we need to make sure that every single character or every, every single input is the same length. So we start off with our URL, we extract the important bit, the second level domain name, and we convert it into a sequence of characters. We then convert it into a sequence of numbers because linear algebra, you know, you're multiplying matrices across. You need numbers, not characters, to multiply across. Um, and then we pad it so they're all the same length. We just put a bunch of zeros in front of it until they're all 63 characters. And that's our inputs. Then we go on to embedding. Cool. So like Kate was saying, we start off with a character. So first character in our domain is C. We're going to convert that to a number, so that way we can do math on it, and then we're going to convert that to a vector representation. Again, so we can do some matrix multiplication. This is a one-hot encoding. This is a vector that represents our three, which in turn represents our C, and a one-hot encoding is just a vector with a bunch of zeros and a one in the spot for the number that it's representing. So you can see this has a one in the third place. 
Now, one hot encoding is really useful because it's very clear. You can look at that one hot encoding and tell me it's a three, and uh, you can easily identify we're talking about the letter C here. But a one hot encoding doesn't really provide you with anything additional. It identifies the C, but it doesn't describe it in any way. So, what our embedding layer does is it learns a way to convert one hot encoded vectors into more dense representations, vectors that contain more information about what it means to be a C. So maybe it's a 0.9 because C is a consonant rather than a vowel, and a 0.7 because C appears frequently at the beginning of words, or 0.1 because it doesn't really appear as the last character in a word. So our embedding allows us to learn different features of the characters that we're gonna be processing. So as we're passing in that domain sequence one at a time, you know, Google, G, O, O, G, we're taking each of those characters and converting them to this dense embedding. And that embedding tells us a little bit more about the characters that we're dealing with. And like Kate mentioned, this is really one of the big values of deep learning, that the network is going to pick out these features on its own. We're not saying consonants versus vowels are important. We're not saying the length of the string is important. These are all things that our model is going to learn as it sees that labeled data and sees those domains that we picked out again and again and again. So once you have this embedded vector, now you can actually move on to, these are the cool, this is the real deep learning uh, part of our architecture here, the LSTM and the CNN. So we wanted to just step through each of those. An LSTM is a neural network that's designed for sequential inputs. A lot of data that we care about comes in sequences. If you're trying to predict a stock price and I tell you, here's yesterday's closing price, tell me what it's gonna be tomorrow. That's really tricky. It's a lot more helpful if you can see a sequence, if you can start to pick up a trend, you know some of the history of the stock. Or if you're trying to fill in the blank in a sentence, like your phone often tries to suggest the next word for you. It's helpful to know certainly the word prior, but it's really helpful to know the whole sentence leading up to that. So I like to eat Chick-fil-A, but if you were just given the two, it would be pretty much impossible to give me an accurate prediction as to what would go in that blank. So LSTMs are built for this sequential data, and as we showed earlier, we're taking these domain, these domain names and converting them to sequences. So LSTMs are these long short-term memory networks. It's a network that has the short-term memory that can capture these dependencies over time in a sequence. And it does that through two key factors. The first are these loops. So you're looking at a single neuron here, A. And it's A's job to remember maybe one particular thing about our domain name. So maybe A keeps track of the length, or A keeps track of how many vowels we've seen so far, or how many vowels we've seen in a row. And A does that by getting new input, so the next character, or if we're trying to predict the next word in a sentence, the next word, and it also gets its previous thoughts on the words that it's seen earlier. So this is that same neuron A, just broken out in different time steps. So you can imagine X sub zero, X sub one, X sub two, are the different words in our sentence or the different characters in our domain. And you can see at x sub two, A's decision is certainly based on the new input, x sub two, but it's also getting its previous output, what it predicted on the last character, x sub one. And x sub one's prediction is in turn based on x sub one, but also what it saw before that. So the information from our earlier inputs reoccurs at each prediction that our network is making. So because of this reoccurrence, we call these recurrent neural networks. So these loops allow us to build in some of this memory as we're going through a sequence. And it captures what we call these temporal dependencies. So here, the French eat what kind of bread? Well, probably not Italian, probably not German, it's probably French. And we know that because we saw that word French earlier on in the sequence. But where recurrent neural networks sometimes struggle is when we have a longer sequence. Here, French was two words back but it gets a little harder to remember when it's maybe a sentence ago or a paragraph ago that we mentioned the word French or France. So LSTM solved that problem by building in a second feature. The first is those loops, the second is cell memory. So underneath that neuron A is a bunch of machinery here, and I just wanna zoom in on one particular part. This line going across the top, this arrow, is the cell's memory. It's passing a memory state on from each time step. 
So it's saying, what's one salient thing about this sequence that I want to remember for my future predictions? So maybe A's job is to remember the location where we are. It's going to remember France. And so that way, when we try to fill in a blank, we can use that cell state. We can use that information that A's holding on to to make a better prediction. And that happens if we saw France two words ago or two paragraphs ago. And this cell state is really just a value between 0 and 1. It's not really the word France written down there. But you can imagine across hundreds of these LSTM neurons the ability to capture something really significant. And this memory is modulated by gates, gates that tell it to forget, and then if it forgot something, what to remember. So if we're reading through a sequence and you see the word France, it says, cool, remember France. And then a paragraph later it says, then we caught a train to Germany. Well, the gate's going to say, forget about France, so clear out your memory that you have, and then add something new, add Germany in there for your future predictions. So this cell state is, is a really key part of the LSTMs along with those recurrent loops. And this is a really cool visualization that allows us to see what's happening inside that cell state. So here we're passing character by character into an LSTM. And the blue values are when the cell state is close to zero. The red is when it's close to one. So this neuron up top, even though you may not be able to make out the characters, you can see it gets redder, gets warmer as it gets close to the end of the line. And then it sees a new line character, and immediately it says, OK, forget what, forget what we were storing, and now let's start remembering something new again. And character by character, it says, OK, remember I saw another character. Remember I saw another. And that value gets higher and higher. This one below is really cool. You can see that it's keeping track of being inside or outside quotations. So that first quote happens, and we're all blue. Very, very low, close to 0. The second quote happens to say, we've ended the quotation and immediately it heats up, that value is very close to 1. So you can see that this cell is in charge of keeping track of when we're inside or out of quotations. This is really, really powerful stuff here. And the most powerful part of it is that as engineers, we don't specify line length is important. We don't specify quotations are important for understanding English. These are all relations that our network is going to pick up along the way as it's seeing that training data. So again, there's no aspect of this where I say, I think for dictionary DGAs, length is going to be significant. That's only going to be something that our network is going to learn on its own from seeing that data. So now we'll talk about CNNs. So you might have heard of CNNs being used for image processing. That's what they're mostly used for nowadays. You have an image. This is a hand-drawn number eight, right? It's very obvious to us. It looks like the number eight. However, to a machine, it doesn't look like this. It looks like a bunch of numbers. So how does it figure out that it's looking at a number eight? The way a CNN works is you give it a filter. And this extracts some aspect of the image that it's looking at. So it can take this filter and map it through the image and summarize some aspect of it. That could be the edges. It could be. Um, different textures that it's looking for. Notice a lot of these look like Photoshop filters you might have used in the past. <laughs> so the same thing um, that you use in Photoshop can actually be used to feed into a neural net. And then you have deep learning, right? You're uh, teaching a neural net which features to look for to find different objects in an image. So let's take this image of Dominic and me, right? Um, it's applying a filter across the image, and it's building up a bunch of summaries of different aspects of it, which it figures out on its own. It then goes from the image to the summaries, but the summaries can sometimes be a bit too much. Um, remember, we are trying to get down to a matrix, and right now it's in a bunch of 2D matrices, so we actually need to get it down to uh, 1D. Um, so you're going to pull together a bunch of results. This might be a series of curves that the uh, different filters have summarized for you. So you're going to pull them together, and then you're going to create them into a linear matrix, and then you're going to feed it into a neural net, which is then going to pick out which features it are important to it to identify things like sunglasses that it might have seen in the photo, or Dominic, or Kate, or a dog. But it didn't really see a dog, so it might output some really low probability at the end. Now, this is for images, right? For text, it's a very similar concept, except rather than looking at a 2D matrix, you're actually looking at a 1D matrix across text. 
So you're going through different sized filters of different number of characters and saying, well, what's, what would be uh, different features I need to extract for four characters or three characters and the ordering about the characters and where we are and stuff like that. And you go through the same exact process except through text. Pretty cool, right? We then take the outputs of the LSTM and CNN. Now, why didn't we just pick one? Well, it's because during our testing and training, we found that the CNN and LSTM were extracting different aspects of the domain names that we were trying to identify. You'll see here that the LSTM um, is picking out the ones in green, and the CNN is, is picking out the ones in red. And we actually want both, which is why we ensemble them. We want something that will take two heads and decide which head to follow, right? So LSTM is talking about the sequence of the characters and the important fe features within that. And that's really important maybe in some domains, uh, dictionary DGAs that we are trying to analyze. But then the other characters might need to be spatially aware. What's the likelihood of these words being found inside of these dictionary DGAs, right? Stuff like that. So we added a hidden layer to kind of pick between them. Then we get to the output. Finally, right, we finally got these probabilities that tells us what is the likelihood of this domain that I gave you being a dictionary DGA. But then there's the next step. This needs to be for real-time analysis. So not only do we have these probabilities that are being outputted, we now need to try and understand them. So let's say I'm fairly confident that my model is super decisive and knows exactly what it's doing and knows when it's looking at a dictionary DGA or not. I could set my confidence to be 75%. Anything above 75% is something I'm going to call a dictionary DGA. And anything below that, I'm just going to throw away. Don't care. Don't need to alert my analysts. But then you're going to let in a lot of false positives. But you also get a lot of true positives. OK, well, that's not good. We don't want false positives. We don't want our analysts chasing down the wrong rabbit hole. So let's try 98% confidence. Well, you know, that's really good. Um, but at the same time, you're probably going to get fewer true positives along with fewer false positives. And this can actually be graphed. Um, and so that's something you really do need to consider as you're following the curve and trying to pick, well, how many false positives can I let in in my real-time system for my analysts? Now, as Dominic said in the beginning, we are complete noobs when it comes to uh, security uh, in the investigation sense. But we decided to try using our model and uh, using a few hours of uh, proxy logs from a large financial institution that requires uh, to remain anonymous at the time. Um, <laughs> and we wanted to see how well we would do. Could we find anything in these networks? Now, I'm about to show you a bunch of domain names. Do not try going to any of these domain names, please. Uh, they do seem malicious. Now, we took a bunch of proxy logs from several hours, and we fed it into our model. So we have URLs, we have the probability, the score that our model has given it, and the number of times that it's been pinged. And this is just a short snippet that I want to show you. Now, do any of these look fishy to you? Do you notice a pattern? What's that? There the, yeah, the part at the end, right? So it seems to start off with three random letters, dot, two, maybe three random words, dot com slash AFFS. Huh, that looks fishy. Now, this is good, right? Our model is finding these patterns without us telling it exactly what to look for. So we kept investigating. And first off, we had to say to ourselves, well, OK, these patterns are super obvious, but what in general should we try looking for? Well, for DGA analysis, you know, you're looking for the command and control network. You're looking for an IP hosted behind several domains. Um, and you're looking for the domains to follow some kind of pattern. And we're hoping that the domains that we're looking at are made up of random words that we can make out, but shouldn't be put together. And we found it. So Boiling Beetle, the blue dot on the top right, um, was actually a domain that we identified in our networks. Now, notice it's tied to a giant gray dot that looks like an IP address. Now, what else is tied to that gray dot? Puffyloss.com, uh, unusualtitle.com. That actually sounds kind of reasonable. Conscious Cabbage is one of my favorites, or Drag Zebra. Well, hmm. well, that's one. What about this one? Oh, we found another one. Silken Threadiness. 
Hmm, that doesn't sound quite right. ComradePony.com is another uh, domain name tied to this IP address. And so we had our analysts look into it, and it turns out that these are tied to ad networks. So we think that advertisements on web pages could be trying to get around your ad blockers by using the same tactics that a lot of malware is using to try and get past your firewalls. Huh, interesting. Here's some other suspicious activity. You want to show this one, Dominic? OK. So another one I, we identified is veryvery.com. Now this one, we trace it back to the IP address. And as you can see in the rest of the graph, it doesn't really seem like it's tied to any other two random words put together like we would have hoped for. But it was tied to download.windowsupdate.com and Trojan win32.agent. Now, again, we're not security analysts, but to us, through ThreatCrowd with this networking tool, that doesn't look like a website that people should be going to, intentionally or unintentionally. And then we tried to deploy it so we could actually use it. Cool. So like Kate said, we found some really interesting results, and that was just in four hours of traffic. Uh, so to call your attention back to that uh, slash AFFF's case, they were domains like attack spaghetti and rediscussed cudgels and weird things like that. And so I decided you know, to go off and see who was querying these domains. And it turned out that all of the domains were being queried by the same machine. That really caught my attention. It seemed like algorithmic activity all stemming from the same machine. So I reached out to the user who said, I don't recognize any of those domains. They're not things that uh, I've been calling. But funny that you reached out to me. I actually just got my computer wiped uh, because it was running so slow that I couldn't do anything. I had to go to our tech support and get a new machine. Now, the case kind of went cold there. We couldn't go in and actually identify in a particular malware family. But that, to us, looks like very suspicious behavior and perhaps uh, indication of some code running on her system that she did not intend to be running. So how could we actually do that? How could we go and go from those domains to a user uh, and do some of that analysis? Well, we used a, a tool that we built uh, called Purple Rain, which is built out of these open source frameworks, NiFi, Spark, Elasticsearch. And essentially, it's a data processing pipeline to bring in all of that data proxy logs, DNS records, emails, things like that, uh, and land them in front of security analysts. But we face the challenge of how do we deploy this model? How do we put this into a real-time streaming environment? That was our goal at the beginning of this, was to not be doing historical queries, but to actually be on the front line, to be picking up on these dictionary DGAs as they were being queried. So we had to fit ourselves into this custom pipeline this pipeline is built using JVM-based languages. So this is running Java, it's running Scala. But our model is built in Python. It's built using TensorFlow and Keras. So it's not the easiest thing to integrate into something like a Spark job. And then our model needs to be able to run really, really fast. It needs to be able to process thousands of records per second uh, at peak processing. So we had a, a challenge set out for us. And we built a model-as-a-service architecture to solve this problem. So here, Spark is our client. And Spark is getting domain name after domain name. And it gets something new that it hasn't seen before. So it gets attack spaghetti. And it wants to know, do I think this is suspicious? Should I generate an alert off of this? And so it reaches out to our model server. It's essentially like making an API call. And it's saying, cool, I've got this new domain. I'd like you to give me your opinion on it. The model scores it and then sends that back to the client. Now, this system is, is nice for several reasons. The first is that it's very modular. We can modify this model and then sub out that model server while the system is running. So we can say, take out that server down at the bottom, put in version 2.0, and we can do that as this is going. We don't have to shut down our Spark client or say, we're not handling any requests uh, for this period. The other nice thing is that the client doesn't have to be Spark. The client can be anything that wants to do domain analysis. So if another tool comes in and says, hey, I want to analyze URLs for phishing detection, well, that can call to this service as well. And then finally, the nice thing is scalability, that these servers are sitting behind a load balancer that can detect when one of them is starting to get swamped and can say, all right, spin up new servers. But to our Spark client, this is all abstracted away. 
the client's reaching out to one single endpoint and doesn't really know if there's one server or 50 servers behind it uh, responding to those requests. So this is how we took our model that was trained uh, using that uh, DGA archive and Alexa domain data. We trained it over long periods of time and found that architecture that we showed off. And then we put that final model here on these servers for our Spark job and for other clients to be able to access. So tying it all together, we found that DGAs in general are, are difficult to pick up, but particularly those dictionary DGAs, because they blend in with the English language domains that we're used to seeing, they're a lot harder to spot. And our co-location approach that we tried failed because the language used in crafting a domain is quite different from the natural language that we use to craft a sentence. Uh, we talked about how deep learning models can capture these really complicated linguistic relationships and how CNNs and LSTMs are both really good at doing that, but in different ways and looking at a domain as a sequence of characters or almost as pixels of characters, as groups of these characters, like, uh, like an image, and how we combine these two to make a model that was really successful in classifying these dictionary DGA domains. And then last, we had some really promising early investigations. We found some uh, interesting domains. We found the slash AFFFs domains that weren't detected and weren't found on any other public blacklist. And the same thing with the very, very domain that Kate showed off that was tied to the Trojan. Uh, once we did some further digging, there were one or two places that said this may be connected to phishing activity, but again, wasn't being classified by any public blacklist at that time. So we could then take that domain and put that on our blacklist and use that to make smarter decisions in the future. And uh, we're gonna deploy this. Uh, we already have one model running in a similar fashion in this model as a service architecture in a way that's very modular. And so any system that wants to do URL analysis can benefit from this server uh, and this model that we've created. So that is our talk. We'd be really happy to answer questions. You can find me uh, on Twitter, you can email us at Capital One. Uh, we'd be happy to talk to you more about this. This has been our lives for the past three months, maybe, so we're <laughs> maybe six. <laughs> uh, but we'd love to talk, talk more about it, and we'll, we'll hang out after the talk uh, as well. So thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Can you answer some questions now? Yes. We are first going to pilot this with a, a human intervention in the middle. So we're going to be raising these alerts to first pass to a human to then say, all right, we're going to then use that to blacklist in the future. Uh, so we're going to have a human intervention always between this. We are not going to be automatically saying you can't go out to this site yet. Oh, the question was, are we going to be using this to actually drop a uh, DNS record? So are we going to be scoring DNS live? Yes. Yeah, do you want to cover that? How are we going to expand it? Yeah, we, we don't have plans to expand this uh, beyond, oh, sorry, the question. Um, how are we going to expand this to look at things like registered Facebook pages and Twitter pages? Right now, we're just looking at that URL feature. So it's a little bit hard to branch out uh, to the things that you're mentioning. However, we're also building in additional models that are going to look at a domain more holistically. So instead of looking at just the URL itself, that string, we're going to be looking at things like who is information and how long a domain's been registered, that kind of stuff. Another question up there? Um, yeah, so are you going to take a look or have you looked into using those characters as well? Or how do you handle anything beyond 63 characters? Yeah, right now we're, we're not, oh, sorry. <laughs> Keep forgetting to repeat. Uh, are we handling any uh, Unicode characters right now? Uh, and right now we're not. We're just looking at our standard dictionary of characters. So basically alphanumeric and then a few special symbols. Uh, so things that are like puny encoded, we're going to miss out on some of those. Uh, although we will say we'll raise a different kind of alert that says this was a weird domain that we couldn't classify. Yes. Yeah, 
Yeah, so we tried, uh, sorry, first question. Uh, <laughs> The question was, did we try building this just in pure TensorFlow to make it easier uh, yeah, to deploy it and put it? Yes, yeah. yeah, so did we dump out the model and then import it using Java or something else? We didn't try that right now, mainly because we have this model as a service system that we like and gives us some additional benefits aside from just the fact that it can be language agnostic. So it also helps us with scaling. It also helps us... Uh, with things like being able to sub out our models with later versions as we update. And not interfering with the Purple Rain pipeline. Right. Yeah. So. And the second question. Did you repeat? Oh, yes. Did we try a convolutional layer within that LSTM network? And we did try that and didn't get as good a result as when we had two separate networks, the CNN and LSTM, and then ensembling them together. So this final architecture that you saw was the result of a lot of different architectures that we tested. And we have a cluster of GPU boxes that we essentially said, try 500 configurations when we come back over the weekend, and we'll see what, what was best. Yeah, so the question was, I remember this time, uh, can you talk about what operation is happening when you take the output of the CNN and LSTM and kind of combine those into the ensemble? Do you yeah. want to speak to that? So we actually take out the uh, step where it squashes it down to a single probability on the individual modules um, and put in the hidden layer beforehand. So it's still taking the raw features that have been extracted by the LSTM and CNN and then making that final decision factor for the output score. Yeah, actually, I have a slide that can tie to it a little bit better. Um, here. So we have our individual LSTM, which looks something like this. We have our CNN, which is taking five different kinds of filters and putting them together. Oh, it didn't quite render that properly. And then um, right before that final output sigmoid is being applied, uh, it's combining the two and then squashing them down. Yeah, so that final layer has still hundreds of inputs coming in, as opposed to just the LSTM saying yes or no, CNN saying yes or no. It's one step before a yes, no. It's saying, here's all the information I would use to make my yes, no. And the LSTM says, here's all my information I would use to make a yes, no, and combines those to make one final answer. Okay, let's do two more. This one over here, and then you. Uh, the question was, is the list of DGA domains that we uh, use publicly available? Uh, so the site that we use is called DGA Archive, and it is open. It's something you can sign up for. Uh, it's not something you can access directly. You still need a login credential. But you can go from there and, and start downloading these uh, DGA samples. And then your question? Yeah. Yeah, the question was, how do we do with typo squatting? And the answer was, is not well. Uh, this is essentially a, in the Venn diagram. The domains are like this. They're, they're not really the same kind of problem that we're trying to capture. Although that raises a great point, that we're, we are missing out on typo squatting. Uh, and so we have a, a secondary system, again, that's going to feed in uh, to help capture that kind of problem. So we're really isolated to just the dictionary DJ behavior with this type of model. Yeah. Do we have time for one more question? So first question was, did we bring in any additional information like who is or information about the registrant? Um, that information has proven to be really useful. So things like uh, these short-term registrations. Attacker's only going to use this domain for a day and then is going to dump it. So it's helpful to know when was this registered and is it going to expire soon. However, it's really hard to do who is at a super large scale uh, and do it very quickly. So this model really just focused on using the text of the URL, 
We're not bringing any who is or registration information, that kind of stuff, for this particular model. Although we have other things that are cooking uh, that will use that kind of decision making. And then the second part was. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the second part? Oh, oh, open source code. Yeah, can the code be shared? At this time, no. Uh, this is as much as we can share this architecture, which does give you a good idea of how the code was built. Uh, to kind of replicate this model, you would need A, a similar architecture, and B, uh, similar data sets. Yeah. One more? There's one in the back. Yeah, so for the co-location model, I'm oh, sorry. I, he was asking um, if we consider any other corpuses for our natural language processing. Um, we are considering them, but because we were trying to do both uh, methods in tandem and we were getting such promising results from just the deep learning, we didn't pursue it any further. But that's definitely something that we're considering further on. Yeah, okay. I think we should call it there. Awesome, thank you so much. Ah! <laughs> 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 Direct hit. <laughs> We'll be hanging out outside. You can chat with us. Thank you very much for coming. Feel free to come up and ask us questions. <laughs> Jeez. Jeez.